Okay, that's right. Golly, my mind's gone. Good morning. We're so proud you're here today. Today is Palm Passion Sunday. We try to do two things in one service. We'll see how well that works today. You'll see that I forgot that when we were making up the bulletin, but because Leah is good, we're going to overcome it, okay? So if you're worshiping online today, then uh, you can find the announcements and the sermon notes listed on Facebook. We hope that you will pull those up. There's also an opportunity to, to give online, or you can give here in the church or, or a, a number of other ways. Uh, but next Sunday is Easter Sunday, and we will not be serving communion for Easter Sunday. I want to... Uh, announce, and I wanted her, I was hoping she'd be able to be here today, but she's in quarantine. Bristol Sparks was baptized last Sunday at Golden Central, so let's give her a hand. You know, we're so proud of her, and uh, uh, we're proud of parents that uh, raise her up to know the Lord as our and Savior Jesus Christ. If there's any children that aren't in the Narthex, uh, uh, now's the time to go back there and bring in palm branches. Uh, we'll have an Easter egg hunt this afternoon. It will be at the home of the Tariskis, and the address uh, it will, uh, is on the announcements. It's up on the board there. Uh, I hope that you can see that. The community Easter service will be at Cornerstone tonight at 6. I hope that we'll support that. This is an opportunity for us to be united together as Christians in our community. And uh, we work together on all kinds of other things, so I hope that you'll come and support this. Brother David Kelly from Trinity Assembly will be our preacher for tonight, so I'll be looking for you. It'll be also be on, online on Facebook, uh, on, the, on the Cornerstone Facebook page. On Easter Sunday, we want to encourage you to bring flowers for our cross. The cross will be in front of those two doors back there, and, one, uh, and we will bring the, the cross up to the front as we begin the service. Larbeth Roberts has agreed to become our choir director. Now, she, she is not here today. She's on vacation, uh, but she will be back this evening, and uh, we will have choir practice at 5 o'clock. It says 4.30 in our bulletin, but it's actually, we've changed it to 5 o'clock. We'll have a Monday Thursday service here in the sanctuary at 6 on Thursday night. 
Now let me see if I left out anything. All right. Well, our uh, call to worship this morning is, Oh, How I Love Jesus. Please join us. Sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Amen. All right, please remain standing. And we're going to sing, Tell Me the Stories of Jesus. We're in for our treat with our children. Tell me the stories of Jesus I love to hear. Things I would tell him to tell me if he were here. Seems by the wayside. Stories of Jesus, tell them to me. First let me hear how the children stood round his knee. And I shall fancy his blessing resting on me. Words full of kindness, deeds full of grace. To the city I'd follow the children's band Waving a branch of the palm tree high in my hand One of his heralds, yes, I would sing How this Hosanna's Jesus is King Let us remain standing for our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. Let us say what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. There are several prayer concerns and joys uh, on the back of your bulletin. I'm going to lift some of them up. If you have more to add, please feel free to do so. Joyce uh, Sowell, is that right? Sowell? Sowell. Anyway, Joyce, uh, I mean, uh, Maddie Berry's mom needed a, a liver transplant, and she's in the process of having that transplant right now. So how wonderful that we can be Amen. lifting her up in prayer. Amen. Amen. To read, okay. I got that down, and I had it on my cell phone, but I left my cell phone in my office while I was writing it down. Jim Levette will be having uh, knee replacement surgery on uh, the 31st, so let's be in prayer for him. Let's continue to remember the Jerry Reeder family. Uh, Jerry used to be our pastor here, and another pastor from our conference, Chuck Canterbury, I think he served in, um, in Florence 
uh, passed away today. So if you remember both of these uh, ministerial families, the Cheryl McNeil family, Mike Oliver, Linda Holcomb. Uh, this is Linda from Russellville, not the one from here. Charles Russell, Myra Thames, Alex Aday, Roger Schatz, Neil Loggins. Let's remember Kathy Johnson, London Perry, uh, Sh Shirley Prestige, and Judy McCreary. Is there anybody else that you'd like to put on this list? Oh, Ben Quinn, okay. Good to see him here. Hallelujah. Yay. Well, we really need to pray hard for him because therapy's no fun. <laughs> and his parents. Yes. <laughs> okay, Myra Collum, been in intensive care. The Bill, okay, the Bill Muma family. All right. Any others? Yay. Congratulations. <laughs> Y'all will, uh, then y'all have to be extra special great, great grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> Any others? All right, let's go to God. Remember these requests as we lift ourselves unto the Lord. Gracious God, on this uh, Palm Passion Sunday, Lord, we remember how Jesus made that triumphant entry into Jerusalem and everyone was celebrating, declaring him the king of Israel. And yet, Father, as we transition through the week, we find that Jesus is on the cross on Good Friday. Father, we pray that as we face the trials and issues of our lives, that even when we go from joys to disaster, that we'll know that Christ Jesus is with us. He made this journey so that we could have life and have it in abundance. We will leave him on the cross today, but next Sunday, it will be different. We pray that Christ Jesus will reign supreme in our hearts and that we can make the kinds of decisions that he made to live in accordance with your righteous and holy will. We are thankful, Father, to be able to worship together as a body of faith, to lift each other up in prayer, to lift other people up in our community, we're thankful to be able to worship together tonight as a community of faith, not as a bunch of people of different denominations, but as a community of faith. And we ask, gracious God, that you would inspire this service and that you would inspire the service this evening. Father, we are looking for the presence of your Holy Spirit to guide and lead us as we worship you. We ask, gracious God, that you would direct the activities that we have in this church so that whether it's worship or Sunday school or youth or, or, children or Easter egg hunts, that everything we do can point us to Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior. Father, we are thankful that Christ has made that sacrifice so that we can have life and have it in abundance. We ask, Father, that as a church, we can convey this message so that people will have the opportunity to have that strength and support, that peace in their hearts that Christ alone can give. We pray for our nation. We pray for us to find a way forward. There are so many issues that divide us. Father, may we find the issues that unite us. May we find that you have a plan for our country and that we can move forward in it. We pray for an end to this COVID virus. We pray that it can be brought under control the whole world has suffered. The whole world economy has suffered. We need a way out, and we know that it only comes from you. Gracious Father, we're so thankful to be able to lift up these prayer concerns to you today. We pray for comfort and strength for each one. 
We pray for healing, support, whatever it is that they need because Christ is sufficient to meet those needs. We're thankful for celebrations. We're sad for loss of life. But we know in both, Father, that you are there and that you care for us and that you hold us close. If there's someone here today who knows not how to pray, for whom no one is praying, please count this prayer for him. Bless him deep in his heart. May know that you love him. May know that we love him too. For we offer this prayer in the name of Christ Jesus, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, will you please stand as we sing, O love divine, what hast thou done? <laughs> Now, I know your bulletin says one thing, but we are going to read from Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. This tells about Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem and is all about Palm Sunday. Hear now this witness to the Word of God. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing, untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything as if it were already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This has been the reading of God's word. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. In response to the reading of God's word, we're going to have an offertory prayer and then our doxology. Let us pray. Gracious God, it is a joy to support your church 
It is a joy in our hearts to be able to give to your kingdom. We pray, gracious God, that you will accept these gifts with the joy that we give them to you and that you will use them to spread that joy of our Savior Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Praise God. be seated. We're going to have a, some, a moment for centering. We're going to play some music and just pray. Boys and girls, come down. We have a special treat this morning. We have a special treat this morning. We have raised the money for our sheep. Let's hear it. Woo! Woo! And in honor of that, I have searched high, near, and far, high, and low for a sheep. <clears throat> the closest I can get to it is our little Lambert right here. Come in, little Lambert. This is our little Lambert. Bah, Lucy. Bah. Oh, you look precious this morning. All right, doesn't, doesn't Gus look very much like a sheep or a little lamb with a little bow in, her, in his hair? Okay, you can go with Daddy in just a minute. He's so, well, this is a poodle with his little afro going, but I thought he looks so much like a sheep, doesn't he? Yeah, I call him Lambert all the time, but I thought this would be very fitting because we We've worked to get our sheep for the Easter season, and it's, it's the week before Easter. So thank you, little Lambert, for joining us today. <laughs> oh, he's all about being petted. His real name is Gus. Good job, Gussie. Lambert. Come again sometime, little Lambert. Bye-bye. <laughs> Look at this fantastic group on the front row. I'm going to give a hand for that. Amen. Amen. Good group. I'm sitting up here. I did that because I ain't going to fall getting up and down. But the, I never get to see what a wonderful crowd we have. It's so wonderful right here at Easter time. Um, and, you know, this is a special day. I know you've talked about it. We've already been singing Palm Sunday songs. But, you know, what if? Oh, there. I see money. Let's not be stick. Yeah. Some of them are beginning to stick it back in the pockets. Okay. Whoa, Nellie. Whoa, Nellie. We're going to have over and above and be ready for our next thing. We'll talk about that next Sunday. Uh, what if, what if we were there on that first Palm Sunday? All right, let's just go back. Like we're in Bible times. We're kids, and we're thinking, we're hearing the adults talk about Jesus coming to town. Now, we had heard Jesus' name. It already been, everybody was already talking about how he was healing people, how he was saying he was a king. He didn't say he was a king, but other people were saying he's a king and he is the Messiah, the king that's going to save us. All the Jewish people, the Israelites, he's coming and he's coming through our town. And we're going to get to see him like a parade or something. You know what we would do? You know what I would do? What would you do? Would you get excited? Of course you would. You'd run to your backyard because palm trees grew everywhere, 
and you would get you some palms. Get you some palms. You run to the backyard. You got get two or three because you're going to give them to your friends too. Whoo, yeah. All right, a bunch of them. Hand them out. Yeah, everybody got a palm. Everybody got a palm. Yeah, we're excited to death. Hand them, pass them. If anybody doesn't have one, all right. And then we'd run out there on the side of the road. Stand up. We're out there on the side of the road. And here he comes. Oh, you know why we're doing this? This is to show uh, of honor and victory to someone. Yes. Oh, yeah, here he comes. Wave them. And then while you were waving, and even, even our parents and adults were doing all of this. They're excited. And here comes Jesus, and you're looking at him. And then somebody somewhere in the crowd starts singing a chant. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Let's hear it. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Our king has come. Yes. And then some people who had on jackets would lay jackets down. And Jesus on that old little old coat riding sidewise on it that Dallas just read about would come across it because that was a sign of honor to someone who had been victorious and of high power. Now we know, thank you. You can sit down. We know that we're still celebrating and cheering and praising Jesus on. I just always didn't get past childhood. I love to have a palm in my hand on Palm Sunday. We're still celebrating Jesus, what he did for us. We're cheering for him. Yes, Jesus, because we already know what he did for us. He was the king, the king of glory, not the king of this world, but the king in a world we're going to, and he's prepared a place for us. So we're still cheering him on. And then next week, we will just get to see that all over again. We'll remember that this day, when we got to see Jesus coming through our town, we got to praise him, and we're still doing it today. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, I'll play praise and glory and honor to you, Father, our King of kings and Lord of lords. We celebrate that very first day that you came through in Jerusalem at the beginning of that week. It was an excited people, Lord. And at the end of this week, we will be excited again, Father, knowing that you rose from the dead to set us free. Oh, what a thing to praise and be cheerful about and joy. Thank you, Father, for it's in your precious name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Wow, will you take these up and lay them back up here for me? Good job. Anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, well. You want to take one home where you can. Our sermon text today will be taken from Mark chapter 14, verses 32 to 38. Hear now this witness to the word of God. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I'm deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake for one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. This has been the reading of God's word. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, Jesus accepted your will. May we accept your will for our lives. Amen. Steve said it all started with two questions that his grandmother asked him. They went by the nursing home where she spent the last three years of her life every Sunday afternoon. And the first question she asked, well, let me tell you, most of the time she had a really good attitude. And when her family came in, she was all smiles and kisses and hugs. But every once in a while, she let her guard down. And she would talk about how difficult it was for her, and it was, because she had lost her husband, two of her sons, and she was bedridden, bed fast, could not get up. And she would say, I just don't know why God is letting me live. Why is he letting me live? And so Steve said, Something to the effect, well, maybe you've got a job to do. 
before God let you go? So that was the first question. Why is God letting me live? And then the second question was a little bit easier to handle. She asked Stephen, and his wife, what did the preacher say in the sermon today? And they had to sputter around because, see, they didn't go to church that Sunday. They had to admit it because the preacher came by on a regular basis and they'd be caught in a lie, and they could not do that with grandmother, okay? So the next Sunday, they went to church. They started going every Sunday to church, and some Sundays they even took notes so they wouldn't forget what the preacher had said so that when his grandmother asked him, they could make a report. Well, this went on for a year and a half, and after a year and a half, Steve and his wife realized that they were no longer going to church because they were trying to tell grandmother what was going on. They were going for themselves. Christ Jesus had become real to them for the first time in their lives. Steve went back to college. He became a minister in 1990. But he put that off for a long time. His grandmother was there in 1977 in that hospital bed. And after they'd gotten active in church, Steve went to an ordination service. That's where they make you into a Methodist preacher. You go to annual conference, it's a really big service, a big deal. And at that service, the bishop said, is there anybody else that feels the call of God on their heart and would like to come to this altar? And Steve knew God was calling him, but he said, "Mm -mm mm-mm-mm. You see, he and his daddy had just gone into business together. It wasn't the right time, and so he told God no. But he got really active in his church, became a certified lay speaker, all that kind of stuff. And finally, one Sunday, his preacher said to him, hey, Steve, when are you going to become a preacher? Seven years. You have to get an undergraduate degree, and then three years of seminary, long years. So in 1990, he was ordained a Methodist preacher. I assume he's still serving a church today. And his grandmother died in 1977, having completed the task for which God had called her to do, to make Steve into a preacher. Have you ever struggled with doing God's will in your life? It's not an unusual struggle. We find ourselves wanting to do what we want, even when we know what God's will is, and they might not line up. This happened to Jesus. Let's see how it played out. After the Last Supper, when Jesus had changed the Passover celebration into Holy Communion, they went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. Gethsemane was an olive orchard, on the hill across the Kidron Valley from Jerusalem. It was on the hill leading up to Bethany. And Jesus knew what awaited him as they went to that garden to pray. He knew what would, he would find the next day. He knew he would face the cross. He'd already told his disciples that he would be arrested and put to death. He told them that not once, not twice, but three times. And in John's gospel, after Palm Sunday, some Gentiles came to see Jesus. And he said, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And after some more explanations, he said this, now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Jesus had resolve in his heart to do his Father's will. Namely, he would face the cross, not for himself, but for all of humanity. He was born for this very purpose. However, the time had come, and Judas had already left to go get the band of soldiers who were going to come and arrest Jesus under the direction of the high priest. Jesus needed to pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am grieved even to death. Remain here and keep awake. The New English uh, Bible translation says that his heart was ready to break with grief. Jesus was upset. Why? 
He did not want to die. He did not want to do God's will for him. He was asking for his inner circle of three, his trusted disciples to pray for him. He needed help. He needed strength. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Not what I want, but what you want. Can you hear him saying, Daddy, please, you created the heavens and the earth. Is there some other way for me to save the world besides having to die? Please, Daddy, I don't want to die. I don't want to go through this suffering that waits for me tomorrow. Daddy, Daddy, help me. Help me, Daddy. Have you known that God wanted something from you and you didn't want to go along with God's will? Steve Groves put off what God wanted him to do when he felt God's call to ministry. The timing wasn't good for him. He'd just gone into business with his daddy. Tim Alexander from Aliceville did the same thing. He ran from God. God called him to be a pastor. He didn't want to be a pastor. He became a very successful pharmacist. He became a member of the city council in his community. He was a leader in his church. I even taught a class to laity uh, for the advanced uh, certification class on evangelism that he attended. But all the while, he was putting God off, and God kept calling, and God kept calling, and finally, Tim said yes. And he did what it took to become a pastor, and he's doing an excellent job serving in the church he grew up in, in Aliceville, Alabama. He's also active in the Emmaus community, and that's a spiritual formation retreat. Have you put off or run from God's will in your life? Have you done that? Some people, unlike Steve or Tim, never turn around and accept God's will for them. And then they die, having never served God the way they were created, doing what God intended for them to do. Now, you don't have to be called to be a pastor to be called by God. You could be called to be a school teacher, a farmer, a factory worker, a doctor, an insurance agent, a banker. Your calling could involve becoming a Sunday school teacher, a youth counselor, a greeter for the church, leading a small group, singing in the choir, serving on the trustees. When God calls, what do you say? Why me, Lord? Oh, no, that's not part of my sermon. <laughs> Have you rejected God's call because you didn't think you were qualified? Have you rejected God's call because you didn't think you were qualified? Right now, I'm talking to a person I'm trying to get to help me teach a class. She doesn't think she's qualified, but the truth of the matter is she's overqualified to teach the class. She's more than capable of doing this, and when she agrees to do this, and note, I didn't say if, when she agrees to do this, she's going to find that God is there, her strength and her support, equipping her to do what he wants her to do. When God calls you to do something, he equips you to be able to do it. I needed a man in my church to play the, the guitar and sing in a praise band. I talked to his daddy about it. His daddy said, he can do it, but he won't. But you can go ahead and ask him anyway. I smiled because, you see, I knew it wasn't going to be me asking him. It might be my voice, but it was going to be the Lord God Almighty calling him to use a gift that he already had. And guess what he said? Yes. He said yes. And he played and sang in the praise band, and he's currently playing in a praise band now. And I keep trying to talk him into coming down here and playing and singing a song for us. Surely they could let him off one Sunday from the church that he is in. God will qualify you. He told Jeremiah that he wanted him to be a prophet, but Jeremiah tried to say that he wasn't qualified. Oh, Lord God, truly I don't know how to speak, for I am only a boy. Well, this is what God told him 
when Jeremiah said that. Do not say I'm only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. God will qualify you. You can trust God to do that. Have you ever rejected God's call on your life because there was something else you would rather do? Often people don't want to become a Christian because they like the lifestyle they're living in now. They don't want to change doing what they're doing. If I become a Christian, I'll have to quit having parties where I get drunk, raise a little. Well, we're in church. We'll call it Cain. How about that? Chasing members of the opposite sex for short-term encounters, smoking a little weed on the side, just living for me. Haven't you heard that? I've heard that. Well, usually I don't hear it directly because people are too polite to say that to the preacher's face, you know, but the, the word gets around. It, it does. <clears throat> Let me tell you what a friend of mine said about that. He was living that kind of lifestyle. And the Lord touched his heart and he quit and he started living for Christ Jesus. And he's praising God daily for his new outlook on life. He claims that he really did not start living until he offered control of his life to God instead of trying to run it himself. The devil tries to make anything but God look so good to us. He doesn't want us looking at God, so he makes everything else look so inviting. He will use people to flatter you. He will send others to encourage you. He'll do anything he can to keep you away from hearing God's will for your life. And so you hear such people say, change my life? Answer the call of God on my heart? Are you kidding me? No way. I'm not doing that. You've heard people say that. Raise your hand if you've heard people say that. Oh, come on, y'all aren't being honest. <laughs> you know you've heard people say that. I promise you there'll come a day when disaster strikes and when there's distress in your heart and you'll want to reach out for help and strength, but you won't know where to reach. You won't know where to go. Your child dies in a traffic accident. Your mother is diagnosed with cancer. Your brother steals from your family's company. You get fired from your place of business. Your spouse wants a divorce. There's any number of things that can happen to you to put you in distress, to make you hurt. And when that happens, you call me or you call whatever preacher is here. You call on the members of this congregation and we will bring you to that relationship with Christ Jesus that will allow you to receive the strength and support that the Lord God Almighty alone can give to us and place in our hearts. I don't have enough time to cover all the ways that we try to reject God and the ways that we're unwilling to accept his will for our lives. So let's go back to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. When we left him, he was begging his father to allow him to live. Jesus came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep awake for one hour? His prayer warriors had fallen asleep. Jesus was by himself in the fight with his flesh. He wanted to live, but he was born to be obedient to God. And again, he went away and prayed, saying, the same words. Oh, I skipped a part, didn't I? Let's go back to that. I just did the first part of that verse. Let's do the second part. When he was talking to them, he said, keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Have you found that to be true? Have you found that your spirit was willing to follow God but it was so hard to get your flesh in line. So Jesus went to pray that second time. Again, he, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. Can you imagine what the tempter, the devil, was saying in his ear? Why would you die for the sins that you didn't commit? Why would you take the sins of everybody in the world upon your shoulders? I know you're pretty tough. 
I know you're Jesus, but that's a big burden to have to bear. You don't have to do this. You don't have to. You can choose to go another way, Jesus. You know, that whip is real. That cross is pretty awful. And you don't deserve to suffer. You know, I know what the devil was saying. It sounded pretty good. Because when the devil speaks deceitfully in my ear, it often sounds pretty good. Luke tells us in his gospel that in his anguish, Jesus prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. Jesus was in a mortal combat fighting within himself to do the will of God. His friends could not stay awake to support him. He was screaming, calling out to God, please, please, daddy, help me. Please, daddy, I don't want to die. I'm your son. Aren't I doing a good job? Aren't I doing what you need me to do? Please, daddy, help me. Help me, daddy. He went back to his prayer warriors. They were asleep again. They couldn't stay awake and pray with him. He went back a third time to pray. A third time to pray. God was firm. The only way to save the world was to die on the cross, taking the pain and sin and torment upon himself. Only the perfect son of God could pay the price for the sins of everybody else in this world, the imperfections that every person has, that has ever lived. Jesus knew in his heart that this was true. He knew it was true, that this was the only way to save the world. And he made the decision in his heart to be obedient to his Father. Once the decision was made, nothing in heaven or earth could have stopped him from going to the cross. Here's how Paul describes it in Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. But Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. What about us? Are we willing to become obedient to God no matter what? Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to deny ourselves and take up our cross daily and carry it for Jesus and his kingdom? The devil will whisper in our ear that it's too hard. You don't have to do that, but we know better. We know that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. We know that no one goes to the Father except by Jesus. We know what Jesus said on the, in the Sermon on the Mount. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. We were made to find our fulfillment in God. We were made in the image of God, and in God's image, we find our lives. After Jesus finished praying, he made up his mind to accept God's will for his life, and he went to his disciples, and he said, enough, the hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Indeed, Judas was there with that gang to betray him. Jesus was arrested. He was sentenced to death. He was beaten with a whip. He was nailed to a cross where he died six hours later on Good Friday. That's what acceptance of God's will meant for Jesus. I want to tell you, what acceptance of God's will has meant for me. I have never known a time when I felt like I was alone. I've always known that Jesus was with me, known as that blank. I've always known that Jesus was with me. I've always been able to find strength and help in God. As far back as I can remember, I have known this. No matter what the issue was, I know that the Lord Jesus was there with me, helping me to face whatever it was. He will be with you too. Jesus paid the price for us when he accepted God's will for his life. We have the privilege of living into that acceptance provided for us by our Savior. 
When Jesus accepted God's will for his life and became obedient to death on the cross, this is what God did for him in response. He said, Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's when you say, Amen. Let's try that again. That's when you say, Amen. Amen. There we go. I can't wait. That's what God did for Jesus. I can't wait to see what God's going to do for you and for me as we accept his will for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our hymn of response today is what wondrous love is this. And as we prepare for this hymn, let's think, what will it take for me to turn my will over to God. Maybe you've already done that. Maybe you've already got all that worked out in your life. But if you haven't, today's a good day to start working on it. What will it take for me to accept God's will in my life? Now, the first thing that it's gonna take is that you give your life to Christ Jesus. If you haven't done that, I want to invite you to do that, whether you're at home or whether you're here in this building. Give your life to the Lord. Depend on Christians that are around you to help strengthen and support you. You're welcome to make this your church home. We would love for you to do that. And if you feel the need to pray at this altar, I will be here to pray with you. Let's stand and sing. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? Gracious God, give us the courage to accept your will in our lives. Father, if, if we failed, if we've fallen short, let us remember that Christ died so that we could have another chance. Convince us, Lord, in our hearts that you love us, no matter if we've turned aside from your will or not, that you love us and that you want to love us into your will forever. Father, may we hold on to you through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.